All right. This is sort of the last piece of the puzzle in ENGR 3024, and that is failure criteria. All through the semester, we've been talking about how to figure out how much stress a structure is under given a particular loading scenario, and now we learn how to evaluate whether or not that's really uh, a good thing or a bad thing. So, failure criteria is about predicting when a component is in fact going to fail given a particular loading scenario. But we have to know what it means to fail. Failure, if we have a ductile material, is when the stress that we have gets the material to the point that it reaches a yield. As we've talked about, I believe, back in part two, yielding may not look like the bridge catastrophically falls down in the river, like the bearing stress or the bearing failure. It's simply that it's gone beyond the material's yield. Um, brittle materials, which we won't really deal with in here, is more often a catastrophic failure or fracture. Fatigue is also a very, very common situation encountered where the drive shaft is loaded tens and thousands and millions of times. And so fatigue failure is a whole different can of worms that we'll deal with in both solid mechanics and machine design for those of you that are mechanical concentration. We're going to limit what we talk about to ductile materials in one-time static loading. We've got a scenario, we apply a particular load, and when we see what happens that one in that one event. Okay? There are three criteria that we're going to deal with, and the first one is the simplest, and it is the maximum principal stress criteria. Basically, you look at the stress state that you end up with, and you say that the material will fail when the maximum principal stress our sigma A or our sigma 1, once we do that reordering and uh, relabeling, when our maximum principal stress reaches the yield strength of the material. Now yield strength, depending on what source you're looking at, may see as sigma subcapital Y or S subcapital Y. This is the one that we're going to use um, in here. So we look at it and we say, is the stress state that, state that we've got larger than the yield strength? Well, usually we actually want to know what's our margin of error or what is our factor of safety. So we look at the stress state and we see how much more could we add to the situation before we get to this all critical capital S sub capital Y or yield strength of the material. Again, depending on the context, you may see factor of safety as FS or a lowercase n. We're going to use the lowercase n as our symbol for factor of safety. Assuming that the stress varies linearly, which may or may not be a very good assumption, the definition of the factor of safety is the factor by which loading can be increased before failure occurs, and failure is when the stress equals the yield stress of the material. So we say our factor of safety n multiplied by our sigma 1, our largest principal stress, is equal to the yield strength of the material. Solving that out for the factor of safety n, we simply get that it is the yield strength over the largest principal stress. All right, so that is our factor of safety in. Still thinking about this maximum principal stress criteria, this is the first one we're dealing with, we could either yield if we have a plus or 
a minus tensile or compressive stresses. So this formulation that we just did, sigma 1 is a tensile case. We also have to remember that sigma 3 might be the most negative or might have the largest absolute value. So we also need to consider the case where we take the negative of the yield strength over this largest compressive stress. So if either of these, or whichever one is the smaller of these two, is your factor of safety. Looking at this graphically, this is now a new set of axes. We've not looked at these before. These are graphing your principal stresses. Your sigma A is on the x-axis, and your sigma B is on the y-axis. And this is essentially looking at the principal stresses graphically, plotting these non-zero principal stresses. If we are within the yield strength of the material, and in this example, we're saying that the yield strength is 40,000 psi. So we can simply draw a rectangle, or I guess a square rather. And if our principal stresses fall within this region, that means that they are below 40,000, and therefore we are under the expected failure. This is called the failure envelope. Pretty simple case. Our next criteria, our next way to evaluate factor of safety, instead of looking at our principal normal stresses, or normal stresses, we're going to look at the shear stress. And this you'll also see referred to as the Tresca criterion. And the reason we look at shear stress instead of the principal stress is that yield in ductile materials, this is a connection back to the things that you learned in 2070 about crystal or whatever materials class you may have taken in the crystal slip planes and dislocations in that atomic lattice. Those dislocations are caused by the shear in the material. So instead of looking at whether our normal principal stress is equal to our expected normal stress strength of the material, we're going to look at when the maximum shear equals the yield strength in shear of the material. Yield strength in shear of the material, we have a new definition. Some places you're going to see that it is a tau sub capital Y, or in here, it is capital Y sub S in the subscript, subscript meaning yield in shear. Capital S for the strength, and YS for the yield in shear. How does that yield strength in the shear direction compare to the regular tensile yield strength. This guy is S sub Y. If we take our simplest of all cases, simple tensile test, we've got a bar, and we're going to put it under loading equal to the tensile yield strength. So our applied load P equals this yield strength And we're going to look at more circle for this case. So this is the same loading scenario where our x applied load in the x direction gives us a stress state where the x normal stress is equal to the yield strength of the material, the tensile yield strength. And that gives us sigma x equals s sub y, sigma y equals 0, tau xy equals 0 on more circle. That looks like the case that we have here, and we know that the radius of this circle, because this is anchored at zero, 
has to simply be half of this principal stress or half of the tensile yield strength of the material. So the maximum shear stress, tau sub max, is equal to half of the yield strength, which is the largest principal stress in this particular loading case. So the shear stress at yield, this maximum shear strength, is half of the tensile strength, and we say that that is the yield strength in shear. From our generic formulation of factor of safety, we have factor of safety times the max shear in the material is this shear yield strength. Solving for factor of safety n, we have the shear yield strength, S sub ys, over the max stress in the material, but we just defined this quantity as the tensile strength divided by 2, so we take that here and we have that the factor of safety in this maximum shear stress criteria n is the tensile strength of the material divided by 2 times the maximum shear stress in the material that we get from Moore's circle. So from Moore's circle. That's your maximum shear stress criteria. Now let's try to put that on the plot on the principal, principal stress axes. If we look at Moore's circle when both principal stresses are greater than zero, so we have a sigma A and a sigma B that are both greater than zero, how do we figure out that maximum shear stress? Maximum shear stress has to be the radius of the largest circle, so sigma A minus zero divided by two is the value for the max shear in this case. We know that the max shear stress equal to half of the tensile strength, so we can equate those two, and we see that the first principal stress equals the yield strength. Essentially, that's plotting a square where your first principal stress is equal to the yield strength, again, in this structure or in this material, we're saying that that's 40,000 PSI. So when A, sigma A and sigma B are greater than zero, we get a square on our principal stress axes. Okay. Now, sigma A and sigma B are different signs. Sigma A is greater than sigma B, which is the way we establish them in the convention. So we have a sigma A out here on the positive sigma axis. We have a negative sigma B on the Moore circle axes. And again, that shear stress maximum value is the radius of the largest circle. In this case, the radius of the largest circle is sigma A minus sigma B. And we know from our definition a couple of slides back that that maximum shear stress is the tensile strength divided by 2. And we take these and equate them and we end up with an equation for the line. If we solve this for sigma b, or our y, equals mx minus the y-intercept, and this is a line with, the slope of, with a positive slope of 1, 
and the y-intercept at the negative tensile strength. So that's the fourth quadrant if sigma a is larger than sigma b. If you have a case where you define your situation and sigma b is the largest number, essentially you're going to come through with the same formulation, sigma b minus sigma a, the yield strength over 2. Again, you solve for your sigma b, and you end up instead with a positive y-intercept at the yield strength of the material. So we end up with our second quadrant plot. Pulling this all together, you end up with this trapezoidal shape that indicates or that the limit of which is the graphical representation of the failure envelope using this maximum shear stress also called the Tresca criterion. All right. We have a third case. This distortion energy criterion, also called von Mises, is based on the fact that you've got two components to stresses in a material. You have hydrostatic, which essentially would either make something compress or expand. They are normal stresses equal in all directions, like that experienced in a pressurized cabin or submerged in a liquid that those hydrostatic stresses don't cause something to yield, that you have to have what's called deviatoric stresses, and those are the ones that cause the dislocation that cause yielding. So again, this is called the von Mises criterion, and for that, we have to learn how to calculate a von Mises equivalent stress. So thinking about hydrostatic, or the fact that we have hydrostatic and deviatoric stresses, um, just kind of a, a fun piece of trivia that these little guys pictured here are regular styrofoam coffee cups, which went down to 3,000 meters. And you can see that even though they're itty bitty, they experienced no deviatoric stress, and therefore aren't distorted just the air has been smoshed out of them. So back to our failure criteria or distortion energy criteria, we have to learn how to do this von Mises equivalent stress. Von Mises equivalent, it's one more new variable or one more new notation in our alphabet soup and this is a sigma prime and we say that yield occurs when this von Mises equivalent stress, which is our sigma prime, equals the tensile strength of the material. The equation for the von Mises stress is cast in two different ways. You can calculate it from your principal stresses, your sigma A's and sigma B's, or if you have your arbitrary stress state, your xy, sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy from your given stress state, these two equations give you our sigma prime. Both are the von Mises equivalent. It just depends on which quantities you have to plug into the formula and our factor of safety using this distortion energy or von Mises criteria is the tensile strength of the material, capital S sub capital Y, over our von Mises stress. If you plot this on our principal axes, principal stress axes, sigma A, sigma B, you actually end up with this nice tidy elliptical shape 
instead of our square from our maximum principal stress criteria or our trapezoid from the shear stress or Tresca criteria. If we look at all of these compared, you'll see that when you have the intersection on the principal stress axes, you have agreement with the three different criteria. It's when you venture away from those intersection points that you have some discrepancies in the different criteria. And the most pronounced difference is along these 45 degree lines where you have sigma A and sigma B or your two principal stresses being equal in magnitude. Looking at an example, if we start with our arbitrary stress state in our XY coordinate system of shear only, we have 10,000 PSI of shear. We're going to use the same material that the yield strength is 40,000 and the sigma x is 0, sigma y is 0, and the shear is our plus 10,000. We put this on our Morse circle where our first point that, first point that we plot is 0, 10,000, the second point is 0, minus 10,000, and we draw a circle that ends up with sigma A and sigma B also equaling a magnitude of 10,000. The more circle is centered, or sigma average, is zero. So continuing our example of shear only, we have our Morse circle. We know that our tau xy is 10,000 and we can move forward. Our principal stresses from our Morse circle, sigma a is plus 10,000, sigma b is minus 10,000, sigma c is 0, plus 10, minus 10, and sigma c is 0. We reorder these to be our sigma 1, 2, 3 principal stresses, so we have there this reorders, sigma 3 is minus 10,000, and we see from our equation of maximum shear stress using these principal stresses and we can use either formulation either cast in terms of the principal stresses sigma A and sigma B or in terms of the original stress state which in this case the original stress state was shear only sigma x equals zero sigma y equals zero so the von Mises formulation in terms of this original stress state um, simplifies pretty well in this case so we end up with sigma 1 minus sigma 3 over 2, our max shear is 10,000. And either way we calculate our von Mises stress, we end up with this 17,321. That ratio gives us our factor of safety. Looking at this example using all three criteria, the maximum principal stress criteria, just simply is my first principal stress larger than my yield strength of the material? Sigma 1 on the denominator with the yield strength of the material, we get a factor of safety of 4.
if we use the Tresca criterion. That's where we use the maximum shear stress value and we say is the yield strength of the material and compare that to two times the maximum shear. In that case we get not a 4 but a 2.0 for our factor of safety. And the last one is this distortion energy criteria, also known as von Mises, where this is another typo, that should not be a sigma 1, that should be our von Mises equivalent stress on the bottom. Oh, look at that. So our von Mises equivalent stress on the denominator gives us a 2.3 factor of safety. So we've got 4 for our maximum principal stress, 2 for our Tresca, and 2.3 for von Mises. And if we compare these on our failure envelope with all three criteria, you can place your principal stresses, our sigma A and our sigma B value, these that come from more circle, sigma A of plus 10 and sigma B of minus 10. If we take that on our principal stress axes, sigma A and sigma B, and we have sigma A of plus 10 and sigma B of minus 10, that's our loading point. And if you look geometrically at the ratio of the distance from the origin to the distance to the plot of the failure criteria, you'll see that those distances, those ratios, are your factor of safety. So the blue is the Tresca. And we see that this distance, the load point, is halfway to the Tresca failure envelope. Similarly, the ellipse, the black ellipse is the von Mises, we have a factor of safety of 2.3 and it's a little further from the origin or there's a little more factor of safety. And the largest one, the red square, is our maximum principal stress. That factor of safety of, is 4 and again you can see that it is in fact four times the distance from the origin from the loading point. So this is your von Mises, is the ellipse, and the square is simply the max principal stress. In summary, why do we have so many different criteria? Um, again, it depends on the type of material and the type of scenario you have. These criteria, as we see, differ the most in the case of pure shear. On that 45 degree line on our plot is where they're going to vary the most. Maximum principal stress, our simplest square case, is not a great fit with actual results, compiled actual results. Um, when you have ductile materials, your aluminums, most of your metals, it's not typically used. However, as you'll see in 3624, we do end up using it for brittle materials. Our maximum shear stress, our um, Tresca criteria, is pretty good. It tends to be conservative, meaning if you use the Tresca criteria, you're often safer than what the real data dictates and it's often implemented in different design codes that you actually see being used in industry. And the last one, your von Mises, is the best fit with actual measurements on structures. Uh, it's a little more complicated to implement but um, it gives you the best agreement with observations from the field.